You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. Well, it's Friday. Here we are. Short episode, not much talking. You're lucky. Yes, not much talking, Philippa. Let's keep this quick. Let's look which authors we're talking to today for our five questions in five minutes. And if you want more, please go back because these authors will have um, had longer interviews a month or two ago. So they are there waiting for you now on Monday episodes. Anyway, the books are You Could Be So Pretty by Holly Bourne and Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman. So You Could Be So Pretty. Let's read the blurb of this one. In Belle and Joni's world, there are two options for girls. One, follow the rules of the doctrine like Belle. Apply your mask. Work hard to be crowned at the ceremony. Be a pretty. Or two, fight the rules like Joni. Leave your face bare. Work hard to escape to the education. Be an objectionable. But maybe there is a third option. Change the rules. Reclaim your power if you can. What would you choose? Very good. And let's go and talk to Holly now. Well, it is my huge pleasure to welcome back to the podcast, Holly Bourne, to talk to us again about You Could Be So Pretty. Holly, welcome back. I am delighted to be back. Thank you. <laughs> well, you have five questions in five minutes. Are you ready for this? I hope so. I hope so. Well, your first question, can you just remind us about this book? Can you give us another summary of this wonderful book? Yes, yeah, so You Could Be So Pretty is a teen dystopian novel exploring beauty standards, porn culture, and the sort of normalisation of sexual violence against girls when they're in education. However, it really is a contemporary novel just written using dystopic language to sort of make a point about the obscene pressures that young girls are under. And it follows two mm. girls uh, living under this society, Belle and Joni, one's pretty one's an objectionable they're sworn enemies but throughout the book they start to learn from each other fantastic thank you and i know every person is different but what age would you say this book is suitable for do you have an age in mind i always tend to tell school librarians like year nine and up although Mm. of course yeah you know you get some really you know some year sevens that go for it and some you know because different kids mature differently so yeah I tend to kind of be like if you're in year nine that's where I'm like yeah go for it yes Uh, but question but it might be as you say it might be absolutely appropriate for a year seven or eight it's and of course right up to age 100 it's um all of those ages your next question is who should read this book I normally say who would this book appeal to but it's given the context of this book it's more who should be reading it I mean perhaps possibly everybody on the planet above year year eight as you say it does seem since I wrote this book it just is getting increasingly and increasingly relevant Mm. as more and more studies come out about how young girls are just under immense pressure to look a certain way because, you know, sort of social media and general media to behave romantically in certain ways because of the pressure of porn culture, how they don't feel safe leaving the house because they get catcalled in their school uniform. It just almost feels like at least once a week a study is coming out that's sort of proving that you could be so pretty isn't a dystopia after all. Mm. So I feel like anyone who wants to visualise what young girls are under and sort of see it for the living nightmare that I believe it to be. Like, you should read You Could Be So Pretty. I mean, obviously it's aimed at teenage girls, but I do think older women would benefit from it as well because it really looks at the concept of ageing and how we fear women ageing and looking visibly aged as a way of kind of breaking the bonds through generations so that we don't learn from our elders. And I, I also really hope that boys pick up this book too and kind of can understand. Yeah. They get to just, you know, have a shower and go, to, go and leave the house and that's it. And whereas girls, you know, can't really do that without societal consequences. I think it, they would be shocked really at how much under the surface girls have to do just to feel like they look like a girl. Well, this society's version of what a girl's look like. So if you could wish for what happens when someone's finished reading this book, what would you want them to then do or think or feel? 
think it's just to think, just to question things. I really hope this book doesn't take any judgment on any stance of whether it's wrong or right to wear makeup or wrong or right to get cosmetic surgery. I just hope it educates people about the reasons why somebody might feel compelled to do that and to kind of be judgmental of the higher power structures that are cause, you know that make young people feel that they have to do this rather than attacking anybody who is complying with beauty standards you know to sort of see us all as the victims of the society and fight the power not the victims as it mm. were is what i yeah. kind of really hope and just sort of yeah i think since i've written this book i kind of see the doctrine everywhere you know i just see you know, it, like people just with full face makeup going to the supermarket. <laughs> You're just like, what's yeah. going on? Nobody can see yeah. it. It's just, you know, and how people feel they can't go, women feel they can't go to work without a full face. I think Hillary Clinton wrote in her autobiography, I think, I can't remember the exact number of hours, but I think she worked out it was like about two weeks of her life she spent in hair and makeup just on the campaign trail to try and be president oh. of the United States of America because she knew that if she'd went out with just her face, like it would, that would be the news and nobody would listen to what she was having to say. It's just sort of, yeah, you just start seeing it everywhere. And I think that awakening and awareness is the first time to start trying to break free from some of it and sort of see how dark it is that we're being sold lots of these creams and potions or sexual mm. pressures. We're, they're being sold to us as, it's really empowering, treat yourself, rather than, actually, I can't not yeah. do this, otherwise society will reject me. Yes, treat yourself by not doing it rather than having to do it. Mm. Well, we come to the final question, which once more is a rather flippant way to end what is a, a most powerful book, but I'll ask it. When we talked last time, we were talking biscuits, and yes. you actually weren't consuming biscuits when you wrote You Could Be So Pretty, but it was by the highly approved Cadbury's Easter egg, so that's absolutely fine. The question this time is, what drink was powering the words, Holly? Again, I was pregnant when I wrote this book. Yeah. Even though I am usually an oat milk per latte person, I just got obsessed with cow's milk and I was downing like three or four pints a day. Um, oh, wow. And I pan yeah, it was just really strange. I just couldn't. It was like the closest I think I've ever come to having a religious experience was like drinking milk. <laughs> it was just so profoundly what my body needed and... Yeah, I would feel a bit sick and anxious if there was less than two pints of milk in the house at any given time. So uh, yeah, my kind of quasi-veganism went out the window and I was just buzzing <laughs> cow juice uh, left and centre. And yeah, the moment my baby was born, I was like, oh, I don't like milk anymore. Uh, but you know, milk and Easter eggs is what built <laughs> this book. Oh, that's just fantastic. It was wonderful to talk to you again and hear more about You Could Be So Pretty. Holly Bourne, thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent stuff. And let's move on to Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman. And let me read you the blurb of this one. Singapore, 1940. A local fisherman finds the body of a missing American archaeologist. Detective Inspector Betancourt of the Singapore Marine Police is first on the scene. Something doesn't quite add up. He finds out that the archaeologist, Richard Fulbright, was close to deciphering deciphering, was close to deciphering the previously untranslatable script on a pre-colonial relic known as the Singapore Stone. This was no accidental drowning. Is there more to this case than archaeological rivalries? Betancourt also discovers that Fulbright had been having an affair. He is sure he's on to something bigger than just academic infighting. In his investigations into the death, Betancourt finds his own life in danger and now he has also put himself on the wrong side of British military intelligence and he is unsure which set of opponents he fears the most. Well, let's go and talk to Mark now. It is my huge pleasure to welcome back to the podcast Mark Whiteman to talk to us again about Chasing the Dragon. Mark, welcome back. Hello. Well, you've got five questions in five minutes. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> First question, can you summarise this book for us? Yeah, so Chasing the Dragon, it's set in uh, 1940s Singapore, so colonial era Singapore, just prior to the, the, the Second World War. Um, it involves a Eurasian um, police detective named Max, named Max Betancourt, who... Um, 
comes across the body of an American archaeologist who, on the face of it, appears to have drowned. But when the autopsy is carried out, he's found with two large balls of opium in his stomach, which sets Betancourt's antenna off. And he is off on the case of who is this man? What what was he doing in Singapore? What was an archaeologist doing in Singapore? And most of all, how did he come to have two balls of opium in his stomach? Mm. Excellent. The next question is, who would this book appeal to? Who should read it? I think well, hopefully it'll appeal to anyone as a as a as a story, as a crime story, as a mystery. Uh, my, you know, I've written mysteries. I think it will it'll refer to it'll sorry it'll um, appeal to anyone who who likes that sort of thing. But there is a good dose of a history of a place that maybe not a lot of people know about. So you, you'll find out if you're interested in, in other places, you'll find out about Singapore, a bit about its history and a bit about the opium trade in Asia. Fantastic. Thank you. Your next question, what do you want us to feel as we're reading Chasing the Dragon? I, I would like you to feel some, perhaps sympathy is not the right word, but but some some empathy with some of the people who were affected in, in this way. You know that there's absolutely there are winners and losers in, in colonial situations, and to get you know maybe just a little bit of understanding of what the life life was like for some of these people. But most of all, I'd like you to be gripped by the mystery. I'd want you to be sitting there saying, "What's going on here?" <laughs> do you get attached to the characters as you're writing about them? Yeah, I do. I do. I, particularly that now they've written two books about the main characters. I, I've got to know them, I think, quite well. I understand, you know, in my head, I know how they would speak or how they would react to things and, you know, what their kind of nuances are. So, yeah, I do. I do get attached to them. That's understandable. It's a good sign that, you know, you yeah, care so much about yeah. them just as readers do. Uh, your fourth question Can you give us your favorite major and your favorite minor character in the book? I think my favourite major character is a woman who is now the, in, in this book is now the police surgeon. So she does the autopsy. So her name's um, Dr. Evelyn Travose. She's a very interesting character. If if you care to read the first book, Waking the Tiger, you'll find out how she how a woman English woman doctor ended up in Singapore in 1939. And there's a bit of a story behind that. But she's she's smart. She's independent. At least I hope that's the way she comes across. And I I. It, it sounds very ridiculous because I write the stories, but I'm kind of always waiting to see what she'll say next, you know, whatever will come to me. But but I, I do like her. My favourite minor character, and I don't know if he how minor he is, but there's a, there's a character named Quick. He's a police sergeant who Betancourt sort of inherited, really, in the first book, and, and he's just hung around. <laughs> I don't think he's ever been assigned to, to Betancourt. But he is... I, th- I find him very funny. I, I don't. He doesn't mean to be funny. He's not a comic, you know. He's not a cheeky chappy or anything. But some of the things he says, I just they just make me laugh. <laughs> oh, that's great! It helps you enjoy your writing time, yeah. I suppose. Well, we come to the final question. And in our full interview some weeks ago, we were talking about biscuits, of course. And your writing was powered by dark chocolate covered. Oat biscuits, I think Oat it was. Biscuits, yeah. Yes. And chocolate orange ones as well. Delicious. But this question is about the drink. What drink was powering the writing of Chasing the Dragon? Tea. Tea. More and more and more. I drink tea. I don't uh, do too much. Although I have, I must say, I have um, switched to decaf tea. But yeah, I, I, I'm fueled by tea. <laughs> <laughs> With your switch to decaf, has it had an impact on your writing? Actually, that's a good question. I wonder if it has. It might be better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, better. Oh, gosh, that's good. Yeah. So I, I think if I went decaf, the world would be a scary place for everybody. <laughs> but never mind. It's just wonderful to talk to you again and hear more about Chasing the Dragon. Mark Whiteman, thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, those are your two books. We have had You Could Be So Pretty by Holly Bourne and Chasing the Dragon by Mark Whiteman. I'm going to leave you. I hope you're okay. I hope you have a nice weekend planned. I'll be back on Monday with more waffle. Just look after yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.